Each one of these images tells a story, and because they're images of conflict, they tell mainly stories of pain and grief and fear and death. But not all of them. There are a handful that tell a different story, and I've included them because conflict isn't only about pain and death. It's also sometimes about hope and strength and courage. People fight because they believe in a cause and because they believe they can win. Often they're wrong, and many of these images depict the cost of their mistakes. I've chosen these images because they make me think. And to me, that's what journalism should be for, whether by words or images, to make us think about the world we live in. You look at that terrible image of the little girl in Uganda, biting her lip as she shows you where her hands used to be, and you can't help asking, who would do something like that? Is she still alive? What kind of life does she have? Or the carbonized corpse of an Iraqi soldier in Kuwait. Who was he? Was he married? Or a father? Journalists are drawn to conflict because it teaches us something about who we are and what we're capable of. The most appalling brutality and the most stupendous courage. I'm drawn to these images because they remind me of our recent history. And they remind me that all conflict is about individuals. The soldiers who fight and kill and die, and the civilians who don't fight or kill, but many of whom die anyway. And of course the children, some of whom fight, some of whom die, none of whom really understand. These images stretch back over 60 years to the Second World War, the independence wars of Israel and India, Biafra, Vietnam, Palestine, Chechnya, Rwanda, and so many more. Many I defy you to forget. The bare-chested student in Chanaman Square, so confident in his strength and power. That iconic image of the lone demonstrator confronting a line of Chinese tanks. The searing images of the attack on the World Trade Center in New York on September the 11th, 2001. Let me say just a word about those images from that day in New York. There are more here from that one day than from any other single event, and there's a reason for that. First, they are all dramatic and powerful images, but they also remind us that that day our world did change. I remember broadcasting for many hours that day from a studio in Bush House, and at some point during the afternoon, a senior BBC executive sent me a message. Don't forget, he said, this is the biggest story you will ever cover. He was right. Some of these images are actually very beautiful, and I've included them because they make me think about whether there can be beauty in the midst of fear and death. Do we risk becoming voyeurs when we look at these images? Do we belittle the reality by admiring the aesthetic? Look at Bruno Barbie's image from South Vietnam in 1972, showing stretcher bearers against the billowing white smoke of explosives. The oil-coated duck amid the burning oil wells in Kuwait in 1991. Steve McCurry's image of the skeletal remains of the World Trade Center after 9-11. How can they be beautiful when they represent so much death and suffering? If I had to choose just two of these images, I'll tell you which ones I would choose. First, Gilles Perez's terrible image of the anonymous decaying corpse outside a church in Rwanda in 1994, because it says so much about evil in such a simple moment. And second, Marc Ribou's image from outside the Pentagon in July 1967, when a young anti-Vietnam War protester confronted the National Guard holding just a flower as an image of courage and of hope, it can't be bettered.